The most important fighting skill probably isn't what you think. The most important fighting skill is understanding your opponent. You cannot defeat an opponent whom you do not understand. There are all kinds of opponents in martial arts and sports, in business and politics, in love and war, in heaven and earth ratio, in whatever it is you do. An opponent is anyone or anything that presents an obstacle to your intentions, obstructs you from your goal, from your heart's desire, your mission. Now there are four ways to deal with an opponent. You can eliminate the opponent, you can abandon your mission, you can avoid your opponent, or you can change your relationship to your opponent. When I was in the Coast Guard, that was a night when we were pulling into either Southwest Harbor or Rockland, I forget which. Anyway, we're pulling into the dock and we're coming into a, a serious headwind and it's sleet and rain and miserable, and I'm, I'm on the forecastle with, with, the, with the bow line ready to, ready to put it out. And the, the old man had the con, and he was goosing the ship up to the dock, and the wind was blowing us back. And he was goosing it up to the dock, and the wind was blowing us back. And goosing and the wind. Well, it came to pass that Mr. Hall took over the con, and what he did was he overshot the dock, and he let the wind blow us back to the dock on huh? And I put out the mooring lines and we squared away. See? The wind can be your enemy or the wind can be your friend. I would submit that there are four dimensions to your opponent. Physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. How much you need to know about each of these will vary with the nature of the conflict. The physical means, how big is he? How strong is he? How fast is he? How long is he? Meaning, how far can he reach? You have to know this just to find your strategic position. The mental dimension means, how smart is he? How much experience does he have? In other words, how long will it take him to figure out what I'm doing and adapt to it? The emotional dimension, uh, anger, fear, joy, surprise, disgust. <laughs> to what extent will my opponent's emotions determine his actions? I'll tell you a quick story. I was fencing with this, uh, this lad. This was uh, quite some time ago. We were fencing saber. We were using the so-called sabers, the light flimsy ones they use in the, in the sport. And he presented me a, a target as he attempted to cut head, and I made a stop cut to his wrist. Now, for those of you who don't know, there's a nerve that runs across your wrist bone, and if you hit it just right or just wrong, it hurts. It sends shooting pain up and down your arm to your fingers, and it, it burns. And So <clears throat> when I made this stop cut to this lad's wrist, apparently I hit that nerve just right. And his response was to drop his weapon, grab his wrist, and he said, oh my God, oh Jesus Christ, oh God damn, I hate that, oh, oh God, that hurts, and he went on like that for a minute or two, and he picked up his saber, and we resumed our bout. Okay, you tell me, where did I attack him the next six times? Yeah, I attacked his wrist, and he would protect his wrist and when he went to protect his wrist, I'd hit him on the head. Again, and again, and again. <laughs> now the beauty of this is, when I attacked his wrist, he wasn't open. He didn't have to move. He didn't have to parry or protect his wrist at all. He was protected. But up here, he responded to that threat because the pain, right? So. That's the emotional part. 
the spiritual part. I don't want to. I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to wade too deeply into this particular quicksand. Um, when I say spiritual, I'm referring to your opponent's relationship to something other than himself, something he sees as greater than himself. Um, an example. I think of Buster Douglas in his fight with Mike Tyson. Douglas was particularly close to his mother, who had been his, apparently his greatest fan. And uh, she had died shortly before this fight with Mike Tyson. And Buster Douglas clearly and immediately uh, said that his victory was for my mom, God bless your heart. And this is an example of how performing not for yourself, but for something greater than yourself or something other than yourself. He did this for his mom, enabled him to fight the fight of his life, the best fight of his career. He never fought as well before. And he never fought as well after. Buster Douglas and Mike Tyson, the Spartans at Thermopylae, the Viet Cong. Some people call that having the moral law on your side. If you have it, you can sometimes overcome incredible odds. If you don't have it, you can get knocked out by a tomato can. In fencing, you learn how to size up an opponent in a few seconds. Now, now mostly this is a function of experience. You know, you, you cross blades with enough people over a long enough period of time, and eventually you run out of things that you haven't seen before. Been there, done that. You get better and better at recognizing smaller and smaller tells. In a thousand little ways, your opponent's telling you who he wants you to think he is. And that tells you who he really is. I know I've said this about a thousand times, and I'll, I'll probably say it about a thousand more times, but your objective is to become the locus of control of your opponent's behavior. That's your objective. Now, how can you become the locus of control of your opponent's behavior if you don't know what motivates your opponent's behavior? We could go into Maslow's mostly misunderstood hierarchy. What does your opponent want in general, and what does he want at this particular moment? It could be physical survival or physical satisfaction. You know, you've got to have air to breathe, shelter, food, drink, sex, comfort. It could be security, a good tomorrow, good health, good job, money in the bank, peace. It could be love friendship, family, a tribe to belong to, a lover, a good dog. Does he play for respect, self-esteem, attention, achievement, medals, praise, adulation? Winning is everything. Maybe it's enlightenment to be moral, reasonable, to be just, to be tolerant, to be free, to master the sacred geometry of chance and transcend death. But let's keep it simple. Fundamentally, you have to know what your opponent wants, what he loves, what he fears, and what he believes, because all people act in accordance with what they believe. If you know these things, you can pretty reliably predict how your opponent is most likely to behave in any situation, how he is likely to respond to a given stimulus. Now you may be thinking, uh, duh, that's all pretty obvious, brother. And, and you'd be right. But uh, let me ask you this. If it's so damn obvious, why is it that most people don't do it? Well, they don't do it because they can't do it. See, it may be obvious. It may be simple. But it ain't easy. Here's the thing. Here's the hard part. Here's the reason why most people fail to understand their opponent. To understand your opponent, 
You have to let go of your biases, your prejudices, all your assumptions, your judgmentalism, your ego, you know, your bullshit. And there are two big mistakes you have to avoid in sizing up your opponent. The first is to assume he's just like you. And the second is to assume he's any different from you. We have this conception of the opponent, who he is, what he wants, loves, fears, believes. But is that accurate? Is it him? Or is it our projection of ourselves onto him? Do we imbue the opponent with our own faults and weaknesses and vices? Do we assume that the opponent must want the opposite of what we want? He must love the opposite of what we love. He must fear the opposite of what we fear and believe the opposite of what we believe. You know, in my ill-spent youth, I had a very soul-jarring experience. I discovered that my nemesis listened to jazz and read John Donne and liked Chinese food and loved his dog. If that was true, how could we be enemies? Or rather, if we were enemies, how could that be true? Do we see the opponent as the villain that we need for him to be so that we can believe ourselves virtuous by opposing him? You'll never act adequately and appropriately unless you know your opponent's true nature, and you'll never know his true nature by viewing him through the distorted lens of your ego. To know who your opponent is, you have to let go of who you think he is, who you assume he is, who you want him to be. Fortunately for you, most people seek to be understood before they seek to understand. And most people never get to the seek to understand part. So if you seek to understand before you seek to be understood, it's pretty easy pickings. Here's a training exercise I prescribe for my students. You can try it too. It works particularly well at uh, cocktail parties, reunions, but you can do this at any social gathering, and once you get into the habit, you can do it most any time. Your mission is to gather information without giving any. Select a person to engage in conversation. Focus on them, and I mean completely focus on them. Ask them questions about themselves. Ask them about their work, about their life. What do they do? What do they like? What do they think? What are their hobbies? and don't give them any information about yourself. If they ask you a question, just gently turn the question around so it's about them. You'll get a lot of information this way. Some of it will be accurate, some of it won't be. But you'll learn a lot about how the person sees himself and wants to be seen. And that is very useful information. Do this exercise whenever you can. Whenever you meet somebody new, get in the habit of seeking to understand before you seek to be understood. And always listen carefully to what they say and what they don't say. Pay attention to any discrepancies between what they say and what they do. See, what they do is what they really believe. What they say is what they want you to think they believe. Observe their interactions with other people. To whom do they show respect? To whom are they rude? With whom will they disagree? With whom will they always disagree? And with whom will they never disagree? Ask, listen, watch. After you've studied your opponent and answered these cardinal questions about him, turn that same bright light on yourself and ask the same questions about you. You may find it's easier to know your adversary than it is to know yourself, which is why it's especially important to do. 
To become the locus of control of your opponent's behavior, you must first become the locus of control of your own. It's very important to understand how your opponent sees you. Remember, all people act in accordance with what they believe to be true. What does your opponent believe to be true about you? How does he expect you to behave? How will this affect what he does? What can you do to shape his expectations to your advantage? I'll tell you a story. I'm at this card game. Pretty big game. I'm sitting out this hand, having a sandwich, and that's how I happen to be able to observe this. One of the guys playing that night was, uh, well, let's say he was a real hillbilly. Sounded like it, acted like it, talked like it. Man was not the most sophisticated person you ever want to meet with all these city slickers. Right? And um, so he's playing cards, he's playing this hand, and. Uh, He's sort of shucking, jiving, golly, he doesn't know if he's going to stay in or not. Oh, hell, might as well, you know, can't dance, it's too wet to plow. He bets and it's going around like that. And uh, he's playing like an infant, right? He's playing like a sucker. He's playing like a rube, right? When it comes down to it, the last two guys in are this hillbilly and one of the regulars. And Hillbilly calls him. The regular's got two pair, kings and jacks. Hillbilly's got a full boat, bullets over broads. So uh, he had that hand all the time. All this shucking and jiving and golly, should I stay and should I better fold? It was all bullshit. He knew what our expectations of him were. And he played those expectations like a fiddle. Got me. So, you cannot defeat an opponent whom you do not understand. Being able to read your opponent is the most important fighting skill there is. Understanding your opponent is how you know what happens before what happens happens. And if you know what happens before what happens happens, you can be ready for what happens when it happens.